then this one is very uh, flat and planar. Mm -hmm. So it's a different species. It tricked me. <laughs> I thought right. it was something else. <laughs> Megan, you just jumped right into our ship to help out. Can you introduce yourself? Hello, uh, I'm, my name is Megan Putz. I'm from the University of Hawaii. Uh, I was on the last ship that just uh, left for breakfast, but I had my breakfast and I thought I'd come back because I saw lots of really cool corals and I wanted to talk about them. Well, we are certainly glad you came back. Yeah. It looks it's like ready a break. We have a <laughs> few more hours left in our dive before we leave bottom, so you know, I've got to get my coral time in. <laughs> Do we have an estimate of the number of sponges and coral that are already described or known from this area? Um, I I don't have a number off the top of my head, uh, but we do have a deep sea animal guide, and that will show you how many things that we've found that are unique in the Pacific that we got nice imagery of. And there are over 5,000 photos in the guide currently, so that's wow. quite a few. Um, you do have some repeats of uh, different animals just so you can get an uh, idea of how things look from different angles, um, different individuals. Uh, sometimes you get a nice good zoom that'll show you some details that you might not have seen earlier. So. It's really nice to have a lot of different imagery. Is that a Walteria sponge? It is. So I'm slowly getting it. You and got what about it. That, what about the, the fan thing on the top of the rock? This one? Yeah. That's Bathy a Bathypathies. Bathypathies. That's a great name. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the black corals. Yep, that is a type of black coral. You can do a partial on the Bathypathies there, Dave. Can you explain to our viewers why it is black, a black coral? So black corals get their name because their skeleton is actually black. They make their skeleton up of a protein. And um, if you were to remove all the living tissue from it, it would appear to be black. But black corals come in a lot of different colors oh. when they're alive. You see them an orange color like this bathopathy, sometimes bright red. Other times the tissue oh, is uh, translucent or white. It really just depends on the species. So you see a lot of variation in color within the black corals. And what kind of sponge is that? That is a Trita pleura, sort of a leafy sponge. It's in the order of Septulifora. Go ahead and push on in there a bit. These are quite common at these depths on seamounts in this area. So we've seen a number of Tritopleuras near the end of this dive. Oh, I agree. Wow. It's definitely got a bit spongier over here. But we have a lot of Chrysogorgia coral. I think that's probably the dominant coral in this community right here. Lots of Chrysogorgia. Yeah, agreed. And lower down. Ramula Gorgia, I think, was what we saw most of. Exactly, yeah. So Ramula Gorgia militaris, those white ones that have the 
fly rate branching. And we are seeing some of those on the sides of the rocks, but much smaller than the ones that we were seeing deeper down. Some of our viewers are uh, surprised that sponges are animals. Can you give us just kind of a quick overview definition of what a sponge is? So sponges are animals and, and not plants, even though they look sometimes like they could be plant-like. Uh, they are animals because they um, have cells, they're made up of cells, and they reproduce, and um, those cells work together in the form of a body. So that's what makes them an animal, uh, even though they are sort of considered a primitive form of animal. Now, don't tell that to sponge uh, scientists. They, they <laughs> might get a little offended. Sponges can, you know, as you see, there's so many different forms. Um, they're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, there's a lot of variety in the forms that these sponges can take, and, and they have the ability to change their body form to fit their environment. Um, it's a little more plastic than you might uh, see in some other animal forms. So, you know, one sponge doesn't always look exactly like another sponge. For example, that Atlanticella that just went by, uh, we looked at one, you know, not too long ago. It looks similar, but not exactly the same in the same way that, it, you know, people will look similar, but they're not exactly the same. So they're very, they're very interesting. How uh, common or rare is it for sponges to be recorded in the rock record? Do we have a, a knowledge of from fossils of, of older sponges and how they've changed through time? Um, I think it's relatively difficult for sponges to fossilize just because of uh, soft body. How, yeah, how soft they are uh, and the types of materials they're made from, especially like demo sponges that um, they're not necessarily have all those glass uh, spicules. But I do believe there are some fossils of uh, glass spicules. Here's a fun little fish. Oh, yeah. It looks like a halosaur. Yeah, that's what we've been seeing at the upper parts of the seamount. This is, at least for this watch, the third one we've seen, perhaps? Or... Yeah, so there, there are two different uh, genera that I know from this area. Uh, we've got Aldrovandia and Halosaurus, and Aldrovandia does not have scales on the tip of its nose, and Halosaurus does have scales on the tip of its nose. So as we zoom in, you might be able to see if there's scales there. Ah, uh, yeah, I, th I think I do see scales. That makes this fish Halosaurus. Earlier, um, when we were deeper down, we saw an Aldrovandia, likely Aldrovandia phylacra. Um, that one did not have scales, but you can see that dark color right here at the tip of the nose. There's definitely scales there. What would be a common name for these halosaurs? Can you come full wide there, please. Um, we call them halosaurs. Um, kind of means a deep dinosaur kind. Yeah. We're going one six zero now. They kind of look like Might like little dragons to me. Yeah, they got that's their so cool. like snake-like body and uh, the way their pectoral fins kind of those are those fins on the either side of the body. Hmm. They stick kind of up and back like little wings, and they have that um, eel-like body form is really useful for efficient swimming, so that saves on energy. And what would their diet be in this area? Um, they're likely feeding on small crustaceans. Oops. Oh, there was like a little floaty in the water. Not really sure what that was.
So Adam, earlier um, we were talking about the top of this seamount and if there was a caldera. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, someone asked that question. I don't think there's a caldera. There are two uh, peaks to the seamount, but uh, and, it, and it falls off kind of equally to either side. There's this little saddle between them, but I don't see a structure that looks like a caldera. In fact, all the rest of the seamounts also don't have evidence for a caldera. So caldera would form, you know, as the seamount grew towards the end of its life is if magma uh, drains or, or d supply decreases uh, within the volcano or beneath it, you could get some subsidence of uh, down at the top of the volcano. But if, uh, if we zoom out on the high pack, I didn't see much evidence for that in this case. Sorry, Adam, we were just talking about off bottom. I think they wanted to zoom out on high pack there. Sorry, say that again? You're talking about high pack just a minute ago? Oh, yeah, if you could zoom out a bit. Uh, yeah, sorry, we were. Uh... You could zoom way out, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it seems to fall off on, on both sides. It's, it's this little gap on the top. But uh, One of our viewers pointed out, if you, do, if you look at the translation directly, it Allosaur would be Salt Lizard, which is a fun name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Lizard of the Sea. Um, I think it's three and a half. Yeah, it's been holding. So it's got to be a very It doesn't doesn't seem like we will make the summit before we have to pull off. Randy, did you suggest nine thirty? Thinking about it, I think we can pull up at nine forty five. Okay. Megan, mm -hmm. can you tell from some of these dead corals what they were based on the structure oh, yes. of the skeleton? Yeah, I can usually tell what they, they might have been, um, maybe not to species, but um, to family. So some of these dead corals that we're seeing are bamboo corals in the family Corradoicididae. And then also uh, a lot of the dead sponge stalks that I'm seeing around are likely the Trita pleura that we've been seeing. It's the leafy, leafy sponge? Yeah, that leafy sponge. And then much earlier in the dive, when we were deeper down, we were seeing those really big, huge skeletons of uh, dead sponges. And those are likely uh, Furia, or at least in the family Furiidae. Did you ever take Latin? I did not take Latin. Actually, I wanted to take Latin in college, um, but the one Latin class coincided with one of my labs, uh, so I had to take the lab over the Latin. Any idea why we use Latin for naming organisms? Um, tradition. Yeah, it's, I think it's just tradition at this point. 
Um, but nowadays, uh, sometimes when we come up with new names, they're not always uh, exactly Latin names, especially when it comes down to species names. Um, sometimes we name them after uh, a person who's done a lot of work in the field. And so a lot of species names might actually be a person's name that's been modified to sound Latinized <laughs> to fit with uh, <laughs> the rest of the pattern of the, the naming convention. Up a bit there more, Jake. Come up a I bit know there Chris more, Kelly please. has a couple organisms with his name on them. One is a stylastrid coral and one is a goniasterid sea star. Do you think in the future we'll use genetic code more than Latin to differentiate, to identify, not identify, but how we uh, talk about different species and organisms? Hmm. Well, I mean, I don't know if we'll be talking in genetic code. <laughs> we might still give them Latin names, you know, for tradition. But I, I do think uh, the work is tor going towards using uh, genetics to identify organisms. Um, having the visual is really important. Yeah. You want to look at... Can we zoom in on, on that one? Yeah, that one is a, another bathypathies, but it's a different Quite species from the small ones we yeah, were seeing. Yeah, bigger, different color. But say uh, using uh, environmental DNA, we might be able to see how many different species of Chrysogorgia are present in this area. Uh, from just visually, it looks like we have at least three different species of Chrysogorgia, but it's, it can be difficult to differentiate them just by looking at them visually. These are the ones that are associated with the pink squat lobsters usually, right? Yeah, yeah, those little pink squat lobsters that lobby. have uh, spikes all over them like yeah. to hang out in these uh, black corals. We did see one that was... Uh, hanging out in one of these black corals earlier, but this bathopathies does not have one. It does have a little polychaete. You come a little wide there, Dave? Yeah, this little pink one. Oh, I right see. Right over yeah. there. Yeah. Looks like it was broken off, too. The top. A little farther. What a beautiful color. Do you know the name of that sponge in the lower right, Megan? This one? Yeah. That one is a Faria, possibly okay. Faria near Oka Recta. Go ahead and push on in there. Yeah, we've Dave. been seeing a number of those types of sponges around. Uh, I can identify it because it has this sort of zigzag tubular look to it. Okay. A little wide. One of our viewers is asking what oh, wait, please. I think causes uh, the corals and sponges to die. Is it just because they're old? Yeah, there's a lot of reasons, but probably age is uh, one of the biggest factors. Uh, these animals can live really long lives, but like everything, um, they will pass on. Uh, so especially when they get to really large sizes, um, they might they might die. <laughs> uh, another way a coral or sponge might die is uh, they just get really, really big and a strong current can come and topple them over. Mm -hmm. And when they're laying flat on the ground, they're not just, they're not getting enough food. Yeah, and we saw so, some really long stalked ones that had been, had fallen over earlier on a dive. Yep. Um, things like uh, this hemichorallium uh, are relatively fragile, so other animals could possibly damage it. Um, there are predators on corals and sponges that would consume the animal. Um, there are also parasites like zoanthids that might grow over. I was uh, just going to ask about zoanthids. We haven't been seeing any on these. 
Yeah, I noticed that. We haven't seen any zoanthids growing on anything, which, as you mentioned, it's, it's kind of odd. Normally we do see them. Yeah. Do we know much about diseases of these corals? Um, no, we don't really know that much about diseases. Seems like the zoanthids are nor like almost always on Paragorgia. Is that not correct? Seems like it's me, um, but yeah, I think some of the zoanthids are species specific. Okay, growing uh, on Paragorgia. Uh, so like the bulla gummy zoanthus uh, will go grow on the bubblegum coral. Okay. That's where that bulla gummy <laughs> comes from, bubblegum. Um, so that's a yellow zoanthid that grows on Paragorgia. But we do have zoanthids that grow Ooh. on the hemichoralliums. Little rat tail fish just swam by. One of our viewers was asking about how much human trash we find on this deep dive exploration. And we have found a few items on this dive and the dive before, the first dive of our expedition. A few cans here and there. We found a bottle last night. We found one yellow flip-flop. If anybody's missing your flip-flop, we know where it is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes we find some really weird trash, too. Uh, I saw a dive where there was a teddy bear. Oh, yeah. Some kid's missing it. Yeah. <laughs> but we're really pretty far away from any sort of civilization. So you'd think an area like this would be pristine, but nearly every dive we do, uh, there's some sort of human impact that's observed. I think most of it in this area would be from cruise ships. It could be. Um, it could also be just because we're in the middle of that Pacific garbage patch where um, a lot of the garbage that goes into the ocean gets concentrated due to the currents. And so these things might fall down um, to the seafloor because of that. Is that a soft coral uh, center left? Uh, this, this one? Yeah. Yeah, that is an anthemastis. Anthemath. Jake, you ready to play? I'll sit down here for this picture and then you can play the remaining part of the watch app. Oh, yeah, I you're see pretty quiet. Pretty quiet, Reg. Yeah. Oh, stand by. Go ahead, Dave, and push on in there, please. What did you call this one again? Uh, an anthemastis. It's a mushroom coral. It's a type of octocoral from what I hear? Yes, it is an octocoral. You can tell it's an octocoral because there are uh, eight tentacles around the mouth, and each one of those tentacles has pinules, those little um, sort of side bits that are popping off each tentacle. So those are called pinules. Like and a, every uh, coral has that feature. Like a okay. feather. Yeah, cool. they're feathered. Oh, 
Alright. Come on, Dave. Thanks. There's a large coral over there to the right. I saw the shadow. Uh, we got uh, talking about. You had to boogie What's a bit there too. Yep. Yeah, that's a nice big Jason Isis bamboo coral. We're close enough to the end that if it gets, uh, if we can't hold position, then it's probably uh, time to come up, I would say. Right. And we're not going to, you know, where we go from here for the next 30 minutes is not a huge deal because we're not going to make it to the summit. So we'll just find that gold-bearing shipwreck and be on our way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just get a glimpse of it in the distance and... Ooh, I don't think we've yeah. seen this today. Is that an umbellopathies? You got it. Nice. Where's my bingo card? Wanna zoom in there, Dave? Oh, so is that like a branching fan or all? Okay. Come full wide again. Yeah. Stay out ahead. All right, I had a question about samples. Are we all full up, or do we want to? Uh, yes, except for our push cores. Okay. Um, but it's, I mean, small things, possibly? I was thinking think possibly a sponge like that. Some kind of, like, grab? Just Yeah, just a little grab of a piece of that. Um, yeah, we could, I don't know what the uh, front bio boxes look like, but Judging by what's written on this sheets, I think there's probably plenty of room for something small like that. All right. So do you want a sample? Um. Yeah. Let's let's get a little small piece of that sponge. All right. Do you know the name of that one? Um. It's a Septulifora. It's in the order Septulifora. Uh, that's about all I know about it. Okay. A full rack back there, Jake. Yep. And I hear we have some floaty bits in the toolbox up forward, yeah? Um, that was not passed on to me. Huh. That's new. This guy. Raj. Happens <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a Thank cucumber you. in there that could get, you know, a little feisty. 
Roger. We got two cucumbers in the starboard side. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll do this quick. Um, yeah, this is going to be a, a crunchy one, one, just so you know. Right me. A little Ooh. crunchy, Reg. Nothing's in with the wooden stick. Can we put it with the wooden stick? Oh, yeah, let's put it with All the right, let's stick. starboard B. All right, uh, go ahead and look. Is this a glass sponge? It is. Go ahead and push it on there, please. Bit there, Dave. Pretty, it looks Quite like a bit. it's a glass yeah. face. Yeah. It's a bit looks loss. perfect for my dining room table. <laughs> yes. All right, how do we want this? Do you want to look a little up there, Jake? We want the bouquet, or we just want a little edge of it? Um, whatever you think is easiest for you to grab, just know that it, it's gonna crunch. So mm -hmm. it might it might be easy just sort of break off up the top part. Yeah, something like this. Yeah. Um, Perfect. Pull away, please. It yep. was a little bit softer than I thought. All right, we're going to go with Stolas and then forward, yeah? Uh, starboard. Starboard, Raj. You want to flip around the cameras there, Jake? Yep. Thank you. Switch those cameras out. Go ahead and uh, open up that drawer when you can. We're aiming for B. B, Raj. And I keep an eye on our delta there. Yep. Should be okay. Looking good. Come on. What's the sample number on that? This is zero five zero. Two dives, fifty samples. Pretty pretty decent. Glad you said that. I wrote the wrong one down. <laughs> Come on. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Nice job. Megan, can you tell us what will be done with just a fragment of a sponge like this since you're not collecting the whole thing? Um, so you can identify sponges by the array of spicules that they have that make up their skeleton. So um, right, Jake, go ahead a piece and of this out there and I'll will this. Um, be put in bleach, and that'll remove the tissue and allow us to see the spicules. Wow. And um, if this is a new species, those spicules will be imaged using electron microscope um, oh, and, sorry. and then written up in a paper. Very cool. Yeah, you're going the wrong way. So what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that's right. There you go. Can you define what spicule is for our viewers? So spicules are the glass pieces that make up the skeleton of a glass sponge. So kind of an internal support. Yeah. Um, they come in all shape, shapes and sizes. Um, glass sponges, their scientific name is Hexactinellida. 
hex meaning six, so these glass spicules often have six rays, so they are spiky. And are they pulling that silica out of the water? Yes. So down at these depths, um, you have very nutrient-rich water, so it's very easy for them to get the materials that they need uh, to build their skeletons. Going a little too far south there. We need to go uh, yeah. kind of lateral over left. Can you age sponges? Unfortunately, there is no good way to age sponges. Um, but oh, yeah, there you go. Maybe someone will think of a method sometime in the future. But yeah, that can be very challenging. Um, corals, unlike sponges, um, can be aged using. Uh, carbon dating but silica can't be aged using carbon dating so it makes it more challenging so there's a challenge for our future explorers mm -hmm. this last bit of area that we're uh, for the next 15 minutes is likely going to be pretty flat unless we see any targets in the sonar mm -mm. It's a pretty sponge there. Have we ever had the situation on a dive where you find your you think your samples are full? But do you find something so amazing? <laughs> yeah, well, there have been times where uh, you, we couldn't sample something because they were full up. Um, fortunately, uh, we can actually take a few more samples than some of the other vehicles, um, just because Hercules' size and our permitting allows us to, to, to take a few more samples than, say, like the, the Okeanos, which only takes a certain number. Uh -huh. um, I think originally they were only taking two rock samples, two by samplers per dive, oh, wow. which definitely makes it really hard to to get something, but yeah. uh, I think they were able to up how many they were allowed to take, depending on where they were. Um, but yeah, we have we have a lot of different tools on Hercules that allow us to collect samples. So we have a lot, a variety of different types of samples that we'll be processing this afternoon, uh -huh. and that includes uh, water samples that'll be used for coralie study on ferromanganese crust, and then the water will also be used for environmental DNA. Um, we have our rock samples, which will be used to help age the seamount. Uh, and then um, we're, Coralie is also looking at the ferromanganese crust. So there's a couple different uses for the rocks. And then our biological samples are going to go to scientists um, studying these animals uh, for different uses, mo mainly for taxonomic uses, but also... Um, the sea cucumbers that we picked up will go towards that uh, food web study. And that's out of University of Hawaii? Yes. And most of the biological specimens will go back to University of Rhode Island then? That's right. So yeah, these will be archived at the University of Rhode Island um, and students and faculty oh. can check them out and then guest scientists can come and, and check them out as well. You're talking about the Bio samples? Or the bio the samples. The bio samples end up at the Harvard uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology. Oh, okay. Oh. But s similarly can be requested and, and accessed by the, any anyone in the research community. The rock samples go to URI. Then. Rock samples okay. go to URI, yeah.
There's also uh, a number of different repositories for biological samples and rock samples uh, throughout the country. Um, yep. For biological samples uh, at the Smithsonian, there's a big repository. And then here in Hawaii, uh, we have the Bishop Museum that has quite a number of uh, samples. And for rocks, there's uh, repositories at University of Rhode Island, Oregon State University, Woods Hole, and countless uh, closets and, <laughs> and offices around the country where, where some scientists keep their samples, but uh, it's really nice to really nice to uh, get them in archives and, and not just uh, so people can check them out, but just so there's an, a really nice record of what exists. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's a ton of work, and I'm sure this is true for biological samples as well. A massive amount of work that can be done on the existing samples. That exactly. I mean, it costs so much money to come out to these places and do the sampling. Um, but what if we've already collected something that could be useful? It's good to be able to make use of that material. And the video library is incredibly important as well, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the data that, uh, that we collect, whether it's bathymetry of, uh, to map the seafloor, video and especially video with the expert annotations that that are being added here so that you can kind of search through and say i'd like to see every example of uh you know this type of sponge what's this one that one's rose the rose oh, wait hold on caliphagus caliphagus oh i don't know no. i'm <laughs> guessing <laughs> something Dang. that starts with an r you... it starts with an a an a it's the magnificent alien Oh, really? The E.T. sponge. Oh, that's the E.T.? That's, I believe that's the E.T. sponge. All right. Cool. I can't tell my sponges part. <laughs> yeah, this, one, this one's hard to see. Uh, okay, so, so you wanted to find It should have those two holes everything. on the back side and then the, the big E.T. opening on the front side. So we're seeing it from the back. Ah. Uh, but you can oh, tell okay. that it's in that subfamily, Bolasomony, because the stalk is coming up on the bottom. Oh, that's... A circle. Yeah, so that stalk is going into the head on top. Hmm. If it was a caliphacus, it would have that mushroom and it would go into the side. Is this a uh, little orange bit? We saw we saw those attached to a couple uh, sponges, and, and there was a suggestion there was a benthic tinafore. Um, oh. that I think is a uh, a gastropod. Oh. But I did see a photo of that uh, benthic tinafore that was on a sponge. Mm -hmm. um, that is called Jalfiella. Uh, also on the rock there, mm -hmm. to the left. And I actually, I think I heard you say before that Keep this is a, 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 a basket star. Is that right? They are related to the basket stars, um, but their common name is snake star. Snake star, okay. So they're actually a different family. To... What's that thing on the left? Is that a Svesta pluma or is that a, a little black? Coral. This is a little black coral. Yeah. Oh. It's possibly Parantopathies. I just don't recall seeing that yet this dive. Maybe we should just yeah. take this rock with the... <laughs> just yeah. take this whole rock. <laughs> just throw it on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a... Uh, what are the ones on the vans? The roof rack? Roof rack. <laughs> roof rack. <laughs> no, no, we just uh, put it on Argus. Take okay. it up. <laughs> we just need a Strap big roll of Velcro. <laughs> so the basket stars I've seen uh, almost look like tumbleweeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and and we got a manip in to collect what we didn't know what it was, and then it got really tied up with the manip, and we couldn't get it off. Yeah, those those basket stars have arms that branch and then branch and branch and branch, mm -hmm. and they can move all of those branches, and they'll just like really grab onto things and won't let go. Yeah, their arms are so long. The snake stars, their their arms do not branch, but they do have that same like really coily yeah. ability. We have a viewer asking what happens to the sediment samples that are taken. Yeah, so what are we gonna do with the push cores that we took? Oh, yeah, great question. So um, push cores, first allowed us to, to collect some of the micro nodules that we've seen as pavement in these sedimented areas. 
and then we'll look at the column of sediment perhaps for the in fauna the animals that live in the in the sediment uh, also for kind of you do any number of things look at the sedimentation rate by uh, doing some carbon dating down through the sediment um, and I'm in particular looking for volcanic ash that uh, gets preserved in the in the sedimentary record. So are you gonna section the cores on the ship or wait until we get back? Uh, probably wait till we get back because I didn't bring a, a set of sieves with me, but typically what we do is uh, sieve for the course fraction. Uh, but in this first set of cores that we took, we took a, a pair, so if someone on board wants to uh, kind of use a colander and, and look for the infant in there um, and, we'll, and they have the time to do it, then we'll do it. Otherwise, we'll just preserve them and uh, work on them back on shore. That sounds like a good plan. So I call this one the macaroni or valve sponge. <laughs> what is its actual name? It's called Faria near Oka recta. Okay. Is that, the same, <laughs> is that the same one we saw a while ago? Yeah, it was a little bit smaller. Really? Okay. Zigzaggy. Yeah, so the zigzaggy tubular sponge. And is there something inside where we see those? Oh, yeah, there's bits? definitely something in there. A little it's shrimps moving. or something. A little pink something. Hard to tell exactly what that might be. It could be um, a shrimp. Uh, that's my best guess is some sort of decapod is hanging out in there. But you could possibly see brittle stars. Um, other small crustaceans, polychaetes. Okay, back row. So we have about seven more minutes of bottom time, and that will also include throwing a weight. Um, just to let you guys know. Roger. So is that little organism trapped inside? Oh no, it probably oh, okay. can come and go as it wants in and out of those tubes. Sponge condo. Yeah. Hmm. I wonder how much the rent is. <laughs> well, there's a really tall one of those sponges that we just collected. Yeah, so throughout the dive, we were seeing these ones that are really skinny, and then there was other ones that were wider and more crenulated, and I think they're different. So I'm glad we picked up this one um, because the other one uh, was sampled before. So we have about five more minutes on bottom as all good things must come to an end. But to be fair, we've, we've been on bottom for nearly 24 hours at this point. So it's been a long dive. And we've got a full basket of samples uh, to process. So we've got our work cut out for us this afternoon. Yeah, the primary driver is the weather picking up. Yep, um, there's yeah, on board I believe some the weather coming in as well. So we wanna get the vehicles on board before any of that hits us. That could be really hairy. About a volcano question, Adam. Sure. All right, one of our viewers wants to know, is there an underwater equivalent of pyroclastic flow? Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, we haven't observed many uh, okay. explosive eruptions or yep. from arc volcanoes in the submarine environment, but uh, you want to toss it? we have looked at some deposits from them and we have in fact i've worked uh, on a volcano where we have seen pyroclastic flows now they're not the hot pyroclastic flows that, that you see on land uh, because the water is very effective at cooling them off but uh, you get accumulations of pumice and ash that over steepen and eventually go down the slope uh, and yeah it's a real different environment one of the cool things is you can get one two two just like on land, you can get the oh, one, fine fraction right. of the, 
Um, I want to uh, go flow left. Detaching from the dense fraction and mechanic, that fine fraction or that ash can go huge distances in the ocean. So one of the reasons that I'm interested in looking for volcanic ash in these deposits is we know very little about how ash produced in the ocean gets distributed. We know that some of it lands on the sea surface from volcanoes on land, and that actually is kind of important in a place like Hawaii, where, where it's oligotrophic, it kind of can fertilize the upper ocean, uh, but we know very little about it in the deep ocean. Can you tell a difference about the origin of ash? Yeah, to some extent. By looking at its chemistry, you can get uh, a sense for its provenance, but uh, you, would, you need to have enough of it to be able to look at some of the kind of rare components in it, the radiogenic isotopes that give, give a true kind of fingerprint for where the, the ash came. So right now we're throwing out that last uh, weight plate that's made of uh, steel that will corrode over time and the core is made of hemp that will also degrade over time. Mm. That gives us just a little bit more buoyancy for the ride up to the surface. How much does that plate weigh? I think it's 16 pounds in air. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Yeah. All right. Let's get around this. 300. Yeah, so Jake, you want to go to 300? Zero zero. <laughs> That's not what we're doing. I'm going to check the wraps. The wraps look good. All right, back row. We're gonna we're setting up now for recovery, and we'll be taking off shortly. Thank you. Yep. One of our yeah. viewers is asking. I can get us stretched out first. Weather could delay dives, and we just wait and hear from our expedition leader. She's um, watching the go weather. Ahead and full jam forward on your jogging there, Jake. So yeah. keep checking back for information about when the next dive will be taking place. And go ahead and dial in auto heading and then just punch it forward on 300. Zero zero. Yeah, that right there is 1.2 knots. I think you can make two. 1.3. It's the theoretical limit. There you go. That's, nice. That's the top. All right. So now for this guy, go ahead and stick lock a little bit forward. All right. And then you're going to take off your Z bias and then start scrolling up for the Z bias. Go to like positive, I'll go full jam on the verts there. So just keep scrolling. Going to log like off 100. bottom here. Roger. Pull up, yeah. Pull up on your birds. And we'll check the butt cam there, make sure we're aligned, which we are. All right, nice. 
Let me check your utility page. Thanks. 16, that's good. All right, good, good sign. Yeah. I want to see uh, what our altitude is when we lose Doppler with the 600 back on. Should be around 75 or so. Then I'll switch you over to USPL after that. So we are beginning our ascent, but continue to send your questions into the chat. ROV pilots, can you take a question? I can take a question, yeah. Uh, we had some questions about bubbles coming out of the hydraulic arm on Herc. Yes, that's um, so one of our joints in the manipulator. Sometimes, uh, um, you know, uh, a certain joint can come a little loose, and mineral oil, which is what fills our arm, uh, will occasionally leak out. This is it's not common, but um, every now and then, uh, because we're at such deep depths uh, with the pressure and with moving all of the joints, um, occasionally something will come loose. So what we'll do is we'll um, service it on deck, uh, check all of the screws, check, uh, check all of the bolts, everything, um, and uh, see where the leak was coming from, and then uh, make sure it's not happening on deck, and then we'll send it back down. Awesome. About another ROV question. Sure. Okay, we have a viewer from the Netherlands who wants to know if Hercules and Argus are unique compared to other ROVs. Are there others that are a lot like them out there? Uh, yeah, there are a couple other two-body systems similar to this one. Um, uh, the the NOAA um, system is is very similar. Deep ROV Deep Discover and uh, Sirius, I think, is there. One that's uh, kind of comparable to Argus. Um, and then there's a couple other types of two-body systems out there that use weights instead of a second vehicle. Um, and then other than that, there's single-body systems that use, um, I think, uh, winches that um, compensate for heave motion. So they don't need that second body to remove the swell from the motion of the vehicle at, at depth. Um, so those are your, your main types of uh, ROV systems. And then there's a couple other, uh, you know, uh, unique options out there as well.
We had Doppler up to 100 meters altitude, four beams. 